All right, class, sit down. Today we have a special class for you guys. Today we are gonna have a case study. I might make more of these in the future. It all depends on whether or not you guys like it. A case study is simply going to be a Lemon School Year episode in which we look at something. It can be a game, a movie, a comic or whatever and dissect it to find out why exactly it works or it doesn't. And today we are going to focus on chapter 7 of We Live in an MMO by Rando Wiz. Most of you will probably know Rando from his absolutely hilarious comics that perfectly portray everyday occurrences made all the more fun with Rando's hilarious faces and body language. Rando has an uncanny ability that a lot of people could learn a lot from in using his statistic abilities to make something that normally be pretty mundane or unfunny if you just told it as a joke really blow you away with your sights going into orbit. Luckily, more and more people are also starting to take notice of Randall's other comic, We Live in an MMO, which is a fantasy comedy comic set in the world of your typical MMO that's probably leaning a lot up against Monster Hunter. Now, if you haven't read up to chapter 7 of this comic, I'd strongly suggest you do so. You can also watch the Jello Cartello stream where we go through it, but I'd honestly love if you guys could go read it just to give Rando some views. Now, the way this is gonna work is that I'm gonna go through each little detail on these pages to explain to you just how good this is. Some of this stuff might be a given or obvious to you guys, so it might be a little long in the tooth, but I'd rather cover all the bases instead of not touching on anything. The chapter starts out with a menacing shot of Lou and of Rando in the rubble. This is a great way to introduce a new chapter as Rando has other times used the chapter change to either jump back or forward in time. This helps us realize we are continuing the story of chapter 6. Lou takes up a lot of her frame and even her hand takes up a lot in the second frame. Her hand is almost as big as Rando's, showing just how much more powerful and stronger she is than Rando. Typically, a great way of showing the quote-unquote power differences between two people is by showing the difference in size. I mean, there's a reason why the more mature and stronger Simone is bigger than Kamina when they meet up in Gurren Lagann. Stuff like this can also be achieved by, say, have the strong character on an elevated position, such as a hill, or have the weaker character slumped over or on their back. A good artist can also use camera manipulation to make even an infant seem bigger than a fully grown adult. Rando is looking at Lou, bleeding from his temple. His right eye is slightly closed while the other is wide open, probably a prevention from getting too much blood in his eye. You can also see lines under his eyes showing weakness and fatigue. We see his hand resting on the sword in his stomach and we can see it shaking. His hand is shaking and not his head. A shaking the head is too much movement and shaking a hand can both be a sign of anger, fear or fatigue as well. We then get three shots of Rando reaching around. The three shots have the exact same background and the only movement is his hand. Typically when making a comic everything that happens in the gutter, the area around the pictures, is left for the viewer to decide. It's kind of like connecting the dots. So when so little happens between the pictures it tells us this is a slow and long process. We also see his hand bonking onto the wall and then he extends his fingers, showing he's feeling his way around as he does not dare take his eyes off Lou. Next we see Lou's foot taking a step forward. Again there's extremely little in the gutter but the movement is bigger between the two. It doesn't look like a weak step but rather a resolute one, an intimidating one. The focus put on her foot could also mean that this is what Randall was focusing on, almost as if you can hear him think she's coming closer. We jump from her foot to her hair that's showing movement. The fact we're not seeing her head or her full figure but rather these extremely close ups, some of which aren't even focusing on the main object, shows panic and chaos. Think of it as a found footage horror movie and how when shit hits the fan, they hardly ever manage to capture the big scary thing dead on. We do however get a nice static shot of loose hand and claws as they light up with magic. This is Rando finding a thing to focus on and for good reasons too because the next frame is in such an angle that we still see the sword in his chest glowing with the same light as loose nails. This is using the laws of Gestalt, a thing I hope to one day teach you guys a lot more about in the future. Our similarities. Because they glow with the same color and radiance, the human brain connects the two. 
We then see Rando grip the rock from earlier and then a big full page shot of him flinging the rock at her. Again, notice how little we see of Lou and even Rando's action. It's kinda unclear at first what he's actually doing. Again this photo shows panic and Lou being cloaked so much shows how mysterious she is. This is a big moment for Rando, hence why it takes up so much space. This is his chance to turn this whole thing around, but as we see on the next page, the hope goes from being there to disappearing in an instant, with Lou gazing at us, and as an extension, Rando. The way this is shown by the free frames makes it so you're sitting there going did it work, much like Rando probably is. But alas, it didn't, as seen by the next page that starts out with Rando looking shocked that his Hercule strength had no effect, to then show Lou bashing his head against the wall. Rando is here using two different techniques that we've seen before to their full effect. First of all, he's using the same static background. This is to establish that the both frames we're seeing is the exact same angle and the exact same distance. But then between the two, even if it wasn't visible in the first frame, suddenly Lou's hand is not only on Rando's head, but it's already forcing his head back into the rocks. This shows an insane speed, it's almost like she teleported. In the second frame you'll also notice how things are blurry. Typically the more clear and in focus something is, the slower and precise it is. So by blurring it up like this, it shows movement, much like you'd see when someone moving fast when someone's taking a photograph. We also see the sound effect breaking out of the frame and the sound effect is in clear focus as opposed to the unfocused frame, showing just how loud it is. Maybe it's even the only thing that Rando can hear at this moment. And in the third frame we get a shot as Rando realizes what just hit him and we too as an audience get to see it. Also pay attention to the height. Lou is so big compared to Rando but if you look close you can see Rando should almost be the same size as her. But the environment is obscuring his legs and body so he appears smaller. And because this is what's known as an open composition we can easily imagine the rest of Lou's size. On the next page Lou's size is further in focus, just look how much space she takes in these frames. She is in control and Rando is at her mercy. The next frame shows Lou's claws and then the next shows them carving into Rando's face. Because we are seeing so little movement we are assuming this is a slow and painful process and with how close it is it becomes uncomfortable for us to look at and we take part in the pain that Rando feels. The last frame of the page shows Rando looking up in agony. He's in such distress even his pupil is unfocused. Also this is just a quick little fan moment, I adore how you can tell Rando's skin is being squished upwards with how the lighting from Lou's thumbnail is hitting his skin. It's a really cool touch. The next page is just torture. The extreme close ups of Rando pulling at Lou's clothes and trying to kick her off shows his desperation to get her off of him, but as we see in the fifth frame, it was to no avail and the claws keep digging. We see Rando gritting his teeth and for a moment we think his anger is gonna give him the power to get free, but as we see on the next page, it was only to give a howl of pain. The next two frames show Rando completely static and the only movement we see is from the particles in the room and the glow of Lou's claws getting slightly stronger. This along with the fabric that Rando is grabbing is being torn is showing how Rando is clinging on to the last strength he has, but he's so weak he can't even move between two panels. The next page is one big image parted into three. This shows how neither of them are moving at all and all you hear is Rando's repeated thoughts about him not wanting to die until another thought bubble pops forth. This one is blue unlike Rando's and the text is blurred. The blurred text is a great way of showing Rando hearing something but not knowing what he heard. And it being blue is also pretty clever as if it had been black one could be persuaded to think that Rando was dying and his thoughts were becoming unclear. The next page starts out with showing us Rando reacting to the voice in the only way he can at this point in time, by moving his eyes. He looks shocked, but still somewhat determined, cause maybe this could mean he heard someone coming for backup, but all he can see is Lou shown by the third frame. But in the fourth frame, the camera is zoomed even closer to Lou and we see the thought bubble again, and we along with Rando can conclude the thought bubble is either coming from her, or is about her. Rando reacts to the voice by starting to think he is indeed hearing a voice, but is cut short when Lou is pulling out Rando's soul, and just as his soul is being ripped from his body, so is Rando's grip on his life tearing, as we see him now ripping the lump of cloth off of Lou's clothes. 
The next page is Lou's snarling face and then a close up of her eye and then the black box with the text no more in it. This shows we've moved inside Lou's head and these are her thoughts. This is further explained by showing scenes we've just saw from Lou's perspective. First we see the scene with the soul in perspective and then with Randall's corpse in focus afterwards, actively showing us what was done and what it has done. The same text box appears again, using the Gestalt law of similarities again, with us knowing the two are related by how they are presented. This time the no more has an exclamation mark behind it, showing a more resolute and determined voice, no doubt spurred on by the vision that has shown in between the black boxes. The next two frames we see Lou having a black thing near her eye that then turns out to be tears and it's then fully revealed in the last frame by showing the crying Lou and at the same blue thought bubble from before, now loud and clear saying no more, showing us this was indeed something inside Lou screaming this. The next couple pages gets a little trippy as magic that we don't understand should be. We see some sort of ripple coming out from Randall's head as it's no doubt getting dangerously close to being absorbed by Lou. To help us understand a little what's going on, not only does the last frames of the page have a white gradient in the bottom that transitions into the next page all white background, but the ripples we see also continues on to the next page. Once again we see the three frames with little movement between the gutters showing this is a long and strenuous action. The next page we start out with seeing Rando being held by Lou. Because it starts out with Rando, we take that as our point of reference, as we know exactly what she's been doing to Rando. This becomes important now that we see all the other people coming in, showing everyone else that Lou has absorbed until finally we see a familiar figure as all the different images fades away into the background that was purposely all black before but is now all white, as a show of clarity. The person Lou is holding is now Lou herself in her quest giver outfit and we see how she is in the exact same pain and agony as Rando and all the others were. And even so, through the tears she still announces her quest. This shows she has been hurting herself while hurting others and coming to the realization makes her demonic form crack. Purposely showing the same shot but with different poses so we can really see the change in her looks and demeanor. Lou screams out, the voice bubble covering her cleavage, as this is a comic that has purposely made a bunch of edgy jokes, so the cleavage would detract from the seriousness of this shot. We see the hand again, this time more relaxed, shown by less strenuous lines on it, as if it's letting go rather than forcing the soul out, and we see the soul return to Rando. Not only does Rando's pupils come back, slightly blurry to show movement, but there's also some shading added to his eyes, showing that there's life in them now. We see Mike's soul that was being dragged into the ground earlier flies back into Mike's body. Again the speed is shown by showing us the same environment in both shots, but then how drastically the soul's enhanced positions have changed position. Mike drops to the floor and we can only assume the same thing happened to Amirul as we see him with the black ooze splattered on the ground like it was thrown out due to a hard impact. Lou falls down too, her face and actually her entire front is hidden from us, making it unclear what state she is in. Rando falls down too, face planting into the ground, a slightly humorous look to alleviate the tone we just had, as a way to indirectly give us the mindset of being in a higher spirit than before, which Rando will similarly have now that his soul has been returned to him. This is further shown by his rather erratic and fast movement that's in stark contrast to the several frames long processes we've seen from him in this chapter thus far. We also see some of Lou's clothes at the far right of the frame, which helps us in the next frame to show that Rando is seeing Lou crying on the ground. Here we for the first time in this entire chapter get a full shot of Lou, almost as if her size has shrunk. She's no longer big and intimidating, but rather small and weak. To real nail home how sad and pathetic Lou is in this scene, we see her crying shape and how she's curled into a ball. We even see her toes curling up to make herself as small as humanly possible. This sad imagery is however interrupted by Randall's foot stomping down in front of her, much like one would stomp a bug. Due to the size comparison now, suddenly he appears like a threat. We get three frames and in the two first, Randall's mouth is in clear focus, going from the open mouth that shows him panting and then the next frame with him biting his teeth together, showing he has come to a resolution, a decision to do something. The third frame we see the same gritted teeth but are now accompanied with Rando's sad expression. From this we can tell that whatever decision he came to, 
is not one he's happy with. And as we see on the next page, what that was, which is to kill Lou. Again, we've mentioned it several times by now, but pay attention to Rando's size compared to Lou. Not even Lou before was this big compared to Rando, and now Rando is towering above her like a giant. He's in so much power compared to Lou. Also, notice how the background is gone. The reason is that the time and space this takes place in doesn't matter. All that matters is the actions Lou and Rando are now doing and the words they are speaking to one another. When we see Rando, we also see him from under him, just like we were with Lou. But there's also another reason one can do that, and it's because it's hard to look badass when we see someone from that perspective as opposed from above. This is why you'll often see a cool guy in a movie or a comic have his head lowered by looking kinda up at you, like a prowling animal. At no point during all this has the comic made Randall seem cool. In fact, he's been crying, weeping and flailing around like a child. And even here, with his big busted buster sword, he's still not appearing cool. The last frame is great as it's once again shown the different positions, but it's also zoomed out so much that their faces are no longer visible. Now it's no longer about their feelings, it's about their actions. The next page we see Lou begging for Randall to kill her, but as she states she wants the screaming to stop. We see Randall take pity with her as he lowers the sword. We see through his actions him taking pity on her, rather than anyone saying it out loud. On the next page, Randall drops his sword and the world comes into view. A way to show whatever mindset either of them were in has been broken and they are back into the real world. The sword also appears extra big with how close it is to the camera, showing the weight that Randall carried before has been mentally and physically cast aside. We see how Lou clearly isn't happy with this and Randall's having a face that's hard to read. It can both look like anger but also confusion and sadness. We don't get to see more of that as we get a close up of Emerald's staff hitting the ground. With it being so close we can't say for certain what's happening, but we know it's a staff hitting the ground from the noise it makes, and therefore that's what we see. Because we don't know where or who did it, we aren't shown that. We do however find out as we see both Lou and Randall look in the same direction and we see Emerald rising and everyone who has ever seen Jojo knows what these sound effects mean. It means something is threatening and that's where the chapter ends. Whew, okay, are you still with me? Now, just like a real teacher, of which I'm not, I can't be 100% wrong when analyzing this stuff, but it is what it tells me as an audience, and frankly, that almost matters just as much. It's up to the artist to make sure the audience gets the desired ideas and emotions, and Rando is a master in this from what we've seen. I mean, this stuff rivals published mangas and movies, if you ask me. If you guys like this type of class, please write on the blackboard what you thought of it, and even if you didn't, please write on the blackboard anyway. Your homework is to go and read We Live In An MMO by Rando, and potentially pitch some money into his Patreon. This has been Lemmy School ya, here to help you make your creative work with a little more skill.